Welcome tonight. Thank you for joining. And I'm going to turn this over to Susan. Welcome, everyone. I want to thank Lee Friedman and the Alpharetta chapter for setting up registration and for hosting this conservation committee webinar for the Georgia Nature Photography Association, GNPA. Um, we have six presenters, two are guest speakers, and four are GNPA Conservation Committee members who will, who will be providing an introduction to citizen science and examples of ways that photographers can contribute to science and help save species and ecosystems. This webinar will be on the GNPA website under conservation, along with a page listing the links in the webinar so you can refer back to them. That gives you just a brief introduction, and now it's my privilege to introduce Caroline Nicholson from the nonprofit Sci Starters to give us an overview of citizen science. Caroline is a senior program director at Sci Starter, where she manages numerous citizen science programs and outreach efforts. Thank you so much for being here, Caroline. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for that introduction, Susan. And hey, everybody, um, as you can see, I've already been active in the chat. So throughout, don't be shy. Feel free to put your thoughts in there. I may not see it while I'm presenting. I know I only have a few minutes, um, but put your thoughts in there, put your questions in there, and I'll make sure to answer it as soon as I wrap up, and I'll be sticking around for Q&A at the end as well. Um, because the big thing about citizen science is it happens all the time, and anybody can do it from anywhere, and photography is such a vital part of it. So definitely don't think that this is the only time where you can get this information or the only time that you can communicate with me. Um, I will be available. Um, I, I do citizen science all day, every day with all sorts of different people from around the world. So happy to help um, and eager to help. Um, really quickly, before we get to the photography specific part, I just wanted to make clear that citizen science is a global phenomenon. So millions of people enjoy science and nature. I know many of you are in that group. I mean, just looking at my fellow panelists back Zoom backgrounds, I see beautiful images of mountains. I see um, a majestic moose, I believe. Um, uh, it, it's really clear that these are people who love the outdoors and love the beauty of the natural world. But there are other people who enjoy science and nature who don't necessarily realize it. Maybe they love looking at birds and butterflies. Or they're intrigued by how the brain works and they wish they understood it better. Or they've looked up at the night sky before and they've tried to spot um, a constellation. Anyone who's done that, they're in good company. There are millions of people just like them. And the great news is thousands of scientists need volunteers. So one thing we like to say at SciStarter is scientists don't have enough eyes, ears, and perspectives to know everything there is to know, to un understand everything that needs to be understood, uh, to answer every question that needs to be answered. That's where you come in. You can help these researchers find answers to these questions that impact all of us. You can help them understand the world, where different animals live, how species distribution might be changing, how the brain works, um, help test cures to different diseases. Citizen science is as broad as science itself. It's everything from astronomy to biodiversity to health to zoology and everything in between. If there's a science for something, there's a way you can engage as a citizen scientist. But sometimes they can't find each other. So these researchers can't find citizen volunteers like yourselves who are so passionate and willing to make a difference. That's where SciStarter comes in. We view ourselves as a bridge. We connect you to the real science you can do, and we connect these researchers, these scientists, to, to the volunteer communities that empower them to um, make even more discoveries. So what is citizen science? Ultimately, it's a collaboration between scientists and those of us who are curious, concerned, and motivated to make a difference. Another thing we like to say at SciStarter is citizen science allows you to turn your curiosity about the world into real impact. Um, and you can participate in citizen science in all sorts of different ways. You can come up with your own project. Um, one example that really uh, honestly moved me in the past year was a woman in Hawaii. She, you know, she, was, she was just a citizen volunteer. Um, she wasn't affiliated with the university or anything like that. I do believe she'd been to graduate school, but um, you know, she wasn't working professionally as a scientist. She really loves monarch butterflies. And she wanted to understand how she could help them by growing milkweed, by growing crown flower specifically, um, which is a source of food for them in Hawaii. So she did the research, she did the legwork, she went outside of her field to figure out a protocol to study soil composition 
to help grow this flower so she could help the monarch butterflies. She added that project to SciStarter, and now um, people all across Hawaii are able to participate. So she came up with her own research question, designed her own protocol, her own set of instructions, um, her own data collection methods. She got volunteers involved, and she's going to have a robust research result. But you don't have to come up with your own project. You can participate in ongoing local or global projects by collecting data or analyzing data. And don't let that word data scare you. Data is just information. Data can be your observations, you writing down what you see, um, or it could be pictures, as we're going to discuss tonight. Because one way to conceptualize citizen science is we're all essentially part of the world's biggest group project. And um, one thing I often say to people, because the word science can sometimes scare people and make them shut down, and they maybe think about a test they failed in the ninth grade, and they're like, oh, I haven't thought about science in 60 years. Um, but it's not a scary thing. It's actually a very exciting thing. Science is a, a tool. You know, it's not memorization. It's not just test tubes in a lab. It's not someone, um, you know, slaving away for years and years on their own. Science can be people outside documenting things, documenting their own communities. Um, science can be a group of volunteers doing projects on their computer, learning how to analyze different pictures to come to a research result of wetland loss, for example, by helping these researchers analyze this data. Um, science is one of the most exciting things we have to discover something new about the world. And you'll see that my source for this cartoon is Dr. Karen Cooper. I really, um, she's an amazing colleague. I really recommend you all, if you're curious about this topic, um, reading either of her books. One of her books she actually co-authored with my boss. Um, but one thing that she said once that really stuck with me was that, you know, we play basketball, but we don't expect to be in the NBA right? We all, we all have hobbies. Why can't science be something that we do just because we like it as well? You can do science without being a professional scientist. You can be a citizen scientist. So if any of this interests you, there are over 3,000 projects, events, and tools that have been added to SciStarter. Some of them are hyper-local. There are some projects that could just be in Georgia. There are other projects like the Stall Catchers Project, a project I really love, that you can do from anywhere in the world just by playing an online game. And by playing this online game, you're helping Alzheimer's researchers test different cures. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Please, please, please feel free to explore. And um, I, if you feel a little overwhelmed by the fact that there are thousands of options, you can go right to scistarter.org forward slash training and we'll step you through the process. So don't be scared. There's, there's a way you can do it that isn't um, you sifting through 3000 different projects on the binder. Um, we can step you through it as well. That being said, I know you all really dig photography. So I wanted to pick out some projects in particular that have a global focus that you could dive into tonight if you really wanted to. Um, and as you can see from this picture, I actually know I actually know these people. We've been using them as a stock photo ever since we went out to their library in Arizona. Um, but the little boy, he's a patron at the library and the woman is a library, um, a, a library staff member they're doing the iNaturalist project. So basically, um, he's using a, a smartphone that he checked out from the library to document natural life right outside. And as you can see, he's using a clip-on lens. That's not mandatory. You don't have to use that clip-on lens to participate in this project and help researchers understand where different types of plants are occurring, um, but it definitely helps. The better the picture, the easier it is to identify and the, uh, the more robust the finding could be. So I just wanted to show that image to kick things off. Um, but really quickly, things can get really inspiring in this space. So if you are looking for further reading, I recommend going to scistarter.org forward slash chasing Steve. Um, so Steve is the name of a new type of aurora that was actually discovered by photographers, citizen scientist photographers up in Canada. So they were able to document a new phenomenon in the night sky with their cameras. Um, and I love this story because they discovered it, they got to name it whatever they wanted to name it, and they named it Steve. And of course, NASA backronymed it. Uh, they came up with um, some, wor some words that added up to Steve that sound scientific, but Steve has a special place in my heart. And I think it's really amazing that photography, citizen scientists, photographers, were able to make that important astronomical discovery. Um, I also, Susan mentioned to me um, that many of you are birders. Um, birding is such a rich area of citizen science. I wanted to shout out 
one of my favorite birders in the citizen science space. Her name's Deja Perkins. If you all are on Twitter, her Twitter handle is naturally wild with an underscore. Um, and Deja has helped me a lot just by, because um, I was really scared of birding, um, I'm very much a novice. And she told me, just go outside and appreciate the birds. And the thing about birding is um, if you can't get a picture of the bird you saw and you're reasonably confident um, in its features, you could add it to this project called eBird. Um, eBird is a very rich source of data. Scientists are able to look at all of the observations on eBird and come to major conclusions about what bird populations might be in jeopardy, how bird populations are changing, other environmental impacts. But if you do catch a picture of a bird, you can go to iNaturalist. And I, I took this photo off of the iNaturalist project. It was uploaded by a member of the global community iNaturalist asks people to look for uncultivated nature. So uncultivated means it's not a flower you grew in your garden and it's not your pet, it's nature. Um, and iNaturalist is a really vital project. There have been amazing research results, everything from understanding indoor biodiversity. So for example, roaches that I used to send in observations of roaches I would see in my apartment back when I lived in Washington, DC. Um, so there have been research discoveries in that realm, but it could be um, about manatees. Um, I'm in Florida, so whenever I'm out on the river um, and I just happen to see um, a beautiful manatee, I'll snap a picture of it, uh, post it to the iNaturalist. It's an app and a website. Um, and the better the picture, the easier it is for the research community to identify it, but that's really helpful in tracking populations. Um, and there have been some major discoveries on iNaturalist. As you can see from this photo, a high school student, this was in 2020 in the Washington DC area, rediscovered a salamander that hadn't been spotted for over 40 years. That is a really vital discovery. And you see this photo, this um, really um, good photography allowed the researchers to identify what it is. And it also acts as proof and geotagged. Um, the geotag allows the researchers to understand where it occurred. I also included this picture, the toilet weasel, because number one, I think it's hilarious, but number two, this was another very vital um, scientific discovery. This type of rare Colombian weasel had never before been photographed before a man woke up in the middle of the night, walked into his bathroom, saw that this weasel had made it in through the window, snapped a picture of it, uploaded it to iNaturalist, and lo and behold, the research community had previously thought this type of weasel was extinct, but here it is, alive documented by a citizen scientist. Um, this has huge ecological implications. And also it went viral because who doesn't love the toilet weasel? So I wanted to give a few examples um, because the thing about citizen science is the best way to learn about it is just to do it, to read the instructions for a project and just give it a try, to use the photography skills you have. If you have a smartphone, that's great. If you have a better camera, that can sometimes be even better. But I wanted to give an example of a smartphone project. Um, the Globe Observer Project asked um, citizen scientists from around the world to help NASA ground truth satellite data. So I'll give an example of one of their protocols, the clouds protocol, by going outside, writing down what you see about the clouds in the app, um, and answering certain questions about the clouds and taking pictures of them, you're allowing NASA to understand whether or not their satellites might be accurate. And you're also helping them with global environmental monitoring. Um, so I think it's really cool that just with a smartphone app, you can help NASA. Um, and I also wanted to give this example. Um, this, this project's really close to my heart. I actually just wrapped up my term as Miss Louisiana Earth. And um, this project was a big part of my platform because people from all around the world were able to help people on the Gulf Coast by monitoring land loss and looking at photographs and classifying them. So it's a little bit of a different type of photography. It's, you know, satellite photos. But um, these, these researchers um, from Northeastern University and Healthy Gulf, um, they needed citizen help to classify all this data. Um, and people rose to the occasion. They did the little training. It wasn't very long, but you know, it was a training to help them understand how to classify land loss. So that's wetlands that are being lost, sometimes because of oil and gas, um, sometimes because of sea level rise or other issues. They were able to classify them and understand um, what areas maybe could be targeted for resiliency um, and just get a better grasp on the problem. Um, so, and it was really cool. There are people from Nigeria who participated who were moved to help people on the Gulf Coast. And it's just an example of how um, classifying photos can connect people from all around the world to understand environmental issues. Um, and I also wanted to give a shout out um, because there are creative things you all can do 
with citizen science. Um, and I know Susan um, gave us some words at the beginning about art and science. You can take artistic photographs that are beautiful, that move people, but also have scientific value. And I've been particularly impressed by a group in Louisville. Um, it's um, a co coalition of different museums in the area, um, local government folks, university folks. Um, they've been getting people in Louisville to take pictures of water to get a research understanding of precipitation because they've had issues with rain um, and they want to understand it in their community better. Um, so this was actually um, by a student. Um, he took a, he received an honorable mention in the contest, but this was also a picture in addition, you know, to being artistically very nice and a good composition. Um, it was a picture that was scientifically valuable. Um, and if you want to learn more about what they did in Louisville, that's the URL you'd go to, scistarter.org forward slash ripple effects. Um, that's what they called it. I thought it was so cool that they're studying the science of rain and how it's manifesting in their hyper-local context in addition to empowering art. But anyway, definitely look that up. It's a really cool and there's a great webinar about how to take a good artistic science photograph that's listed on that page. But they were able to submit those photos to the IC Change Project. So this is a global community of people and this project essentially empowers people to be environmental reporters. And they ask you to take pictures and describe what you see in your own community. Um, and it's a SciStarter affiliate. So if you find this project on SciStarter and then go to IC Change, if you use the same email address to sign up for both, then all of your contributions will also get credited in your SciStarter account. But that's a side note. Um, it's a very simple project to do. Um, all you do is post what you see, um, uh, take a good picture that's rep hopefully representative of whatever you're documenting. It could be flooding, it could be heat. Um, if you just see like an environmental problem or you just have an observation about your local environment, you can post that to IC Change. And when enough people post something about it, um, research results can um, occur. So in Los Angeles, California, enough people posted about drought stressed trees but they were able to have a research result about the future of urban trees in California. Um, I see change has been particularly active in New Orleans. Enough people have posted about water they see on the street um, that um, the city has been able to incorporate those posts and the, the scientific research result from them into stormwater engineering plants. And also posts on IC Change are helping the local health department in New Orleans understand heat waves. So just people posting a picture when it's hot, showing the impact on the local uh, flora and fauna, and also describing the impact on their own lives. And um, in kind of my neck of the woods in Florida, um, IC Change has been particularly vital in Miami. So a really good photograph um, will help. The, there, there's a partnership between IC Change and the city of Miami now, and these photographs where if you show where on the sidewalk there might be floodwaters or things like that, the better the photograph, the better they're able to think about the severity and how to address the problem. And they're able to pair these photographs um, with other types of data, like inches of rainfall that day or the temperature that day. So um, all of this comes together, the photos complemented by other types of data like numbers to give a full picture and to give a, um, a potential shared understanding for action. Uh, I know I'm almost out of time, so I'm just going to go through. So you've got some quick examples of how people are using IC Change in Miami. Um, but in short, I know I just threw a lot at you. I gave you a lot of different project examples. If you were feeling overwhelmed at all, just go to SciStarter.org forward slash training. We'll really step you through the process, and uh, it's nothing to be scared of. And the beautiful thing about um, citizen science is the projects we talked about tonight, photography is a vital part of it. You can, you know... If you have a really good camera, you can take superb pictures and those can be really helpful for identifying different things. But even if you just have a smartphone like myself, you can take pictures and identify things that matter to help us understand the world better and to turn your curiosity into impact. So thanks for listening to me and thank you for making a difference with citizen science. Thank you so much, Carolyn. That was fabulous information and now I have the privilege of introducing Andrew Snyder. He is a biologist and nature photographer. He is co-chair of NAMPA's Conservation Committee. He's going to be telling us about NAM NAMPA's citizen science projects and resources. NAMPA is the North American Nature Photography Association. And my understanding is Andrew also works for Rewild. So Andrew, we're so excited to have you and I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much for the uh, introduction and the opportunity. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Okay. 
So like Susan said, I'm here to kind of both talk about um, what we at NAMPA have initiated for um, involving folks in citizen science, but also to speak from this side of citizen science as an actual conservation biologist. So in my career, I wear two hats, I always have. Um, so by training, I'm a conservation biologist as well as a herpetologist. Um, that's someone who works with amphibians and reptiles. And in my current role, um, I am the key biodiversity areas coordinator for Rewild. And these just broadly are international sites that have scientific criteria and thresholds that are recognized as vitally important for the persistence of biodiversity. And I'll chime in in a little bit how citizen science can apply to that concept. Um, but then from my photography background, um, I'm a trained photographer and science communicator, um, currently the co-chair of NAMPA's Conservation Committee. And before that, I served for three years on the NAMPA board. So much of this is going to sound familiar as Caroline touched on a lot of it, but I'm hoping to bring the approach kind of more directly to you folks as photographers, as kind of your main bread and butter. Um, so citizen science is typically known by many different names. It could be community science, crowd science, crowdsource science, civic science, volunteer monitoring, network science. The list goes on and on. But as Caroline summed up, and I will just reiterate, citizen science is when scientists and researchers and other folks that are doing some particular type of research Enlist anyone, it could be kids, college students, adults, um, to record data. Uh, in our instance, it will be in the form of photographs um, of their encounters with the world around them. Um, and this is vital to understanding what is exactly living around us at any given time. Citizen science is typically collaborative, scientific research that's conducted in whole or in part by amateur scientists. So, in my background through NAMPA, the amount of people that I've talked to that had always one day wanted to be a scientist or a biologist, but you know, something in life happened and they went down a different career path, but science and the understanding of the world around them was still deeply important to them. Um, you know, so this is the perfect opportunity to actually put that hope and desire into practice, no matter where you are in life. Uh, it's sometimes described as public participation in scientific research, um, but the most important take home point is that anyone can make a scientific observation. You don't need to be a trained biologist. You don't need to have your PhD. You don't need to travel to the far reaches of the earth and the deepest jungles. Any type of observation you make in the world around you is an important scientific observation. So the value of citizen scientists, of science, it's, it's impossible for scientists to be in all places at all times. Scientists have lots of questions that often cover really large areas and they just, resources don't allow them to be everywhere at any given point. And this is where citizen scientists really come in. They can provide the information at both spatial and temporal scales, so in space and across time, that might not be able to be gathered otherwise. And again, every single contributed observation, no matter how common the species, equals data. And this is kind of the key point that I try to emphasize with NAMPA and with photographers in general. It doesn't matter how common the species is, it doesn't matter how amazing the image is, that record, whatever you took a picture of, is valuable data to someone. So as a non-scientist, what can a scientific observation be? Um, you go out somewhere in the field, you know, you may be on a specific birding mission and you want to go into the forest and shoot every single bird that you find. You go out, you shoot it, and then you now have that data that's available to contribute to citizen science projects. The only kind of key requirement is that it's clear enough in order to be able to accurately identify the species, um, because without being able to accurately identify a species, obviously that information is, is not going to be quite as relevant. 
Um, but importantly, from the photography side of things, again, images do not need to be aesthetically or compositionally perfect. I know as a photographer myself, I'll go out and I'll shoot 10, 15 pictures of the exact same subject and only, can you guys hear me now? Yes, you're back. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so to reiterate the point about images being aesthetically pleasing, they don't need to be. And what I would encourage you to do, instead of deleting all of those images that aren't worthy of being on your website or in your portfolio, to consider contributing these to citizen science databases. So how does photography aid citizen science? For one, it can get the public excited. As Caroline mentioned with that example of the salamander that hadn't been observed for 40 years, that's exciting. People want to know about this. You know, not everybody thinks about just going into their own backyard and seeing what they can find, figuring, again, if I'm not going to some tropical rainforest, I'm not going to make some interesting find. And that's just simply not true. Additionally, photos are integral for raising awareness and also raising funding um, to support the science that these photographers are contributing their citizen science data. And if I haven't made the point abundantly clear yet, photographs act as data. The sightings will inform scientists of important findings such as range extensions. They can have, help track seasonal changes in migration. They can track blooming times for flowers. They can track the leafing of trees and other plants. And all of this indicates what's happening in a given place over a period of time. So at Nampa, we largely encourage people to use the two biggest citizen science databases. Um, again, that Caroline mentioned, these are both eBird and iNaturalist. They both have a web platform as well as really user-friendly apps for your phone. Um, eBird does not require photo verification. Um, you can actually make observations offline and then upload them when you have service. And then iNaturalist allows you to also to use your cell phone, take a picture and upload it directly. But while we can do this, and I'm sure everybody goes out with their camera or with their cell phone while they're shooting, um, what I would encourage is after you edit your photos and select one or two images of each species that you've encountered to go onto the websites and upload them directly there. And as I mentioned in about in contributing to important publications, um, you know, this isn't just science that informs the scientists. The science actually goes into the research and produces key publications in peer-reviewed journals. So just a few that I've pulled out from over the last few years, species distribution models for a migratory bird based on citizen science and satellite tracking. Um, here, there's one about citizen science programs helping provide information on national patterns of bee assemblages. Uh, monitoring pollination services. In this example down below from India, um, there was a bird that through extensive citizen science tracking of when it occurred in a given region, turned out that it actually just preceded the monsoon rains. And it wasn't without the citizen science monitoring that these two became correlated with one another. And then here in this instance, in search of the horn frog in Argentina, complementing field surveys with citizen science. As a biologist, so I do my research in South America in a country called Guyana, um, and I do amphibian and reptile research. And you know, you're in the field for two or three weeks and the weather is gonna completely determine what you might find while you're out there. And it might be perfect habitat for a given species, but no matter how much surveying you do, you just don't encounter you know, what you're after. But people who go in after you, whether it is tourists or whether it's local communities, um, them having access to things like iNaturalist contributes this key data that us as researchers might not have been able to actually get ourselves. So at Nampa, what we started to do is to put together a database of citizen science projects that specifically cater towards photographers. Um, we, I think, have about 40 to 50 projects listed at the moment, um, but it is still not exhaustive. It, we're constantly building on it as new projects come to my attention, they get added. Um, 
And we just figured it was a great opportunity to provide local photographers with projects in their own backyard that they could contribute to. As again, a, a biologist, a conservation biologist by training and what I consider myself as a conservation photographer, I've been constantly approached by people wanting to know how they can get into conservation photography. And these citizen science projects offer that exact opportunity. Your work contributing to scientific understanding is simultaneously contributing to conservation. So additionally, um, one of the big things we've spearheaded is we recognize just how big and powerful iNaturalist is as a platform. Um, <clears throat> so what we decided to do was to set up a series of regional projects, which all ultimately feed into one larger umbrella project. So that way at Nampa, we can see in a given year how much our photographers are basically contributing to the science. So we established our umbrella project in iNaturalist less than one year ago. And we've had a few social media pushes and have included it in our um, emails that go out to the members, but not a very, very significant push overall. And so in less than one year, we already have 64,076 observations being unique observations, 8,566 different species recorded. And that's only from 84 observers. That is only a fraction of the NAMPA membership. We're trying to encourage people to get out and use it more. But this just goes to show how small a number of people can make such a significant impact. And this includes range restricted species, it includes threatened species, and it also includes some of the most common species. And then to take this a little bit further, one of the approaches that we're taking um, specifically for our citizen science approach is to launch a series of bio blitzes. So I mentioned before about, you know, there's obviously many people love photography specifically for shooting birds. Um, but what we're trying to get people to start thinking about is trying to go to an area and document as many species as you can. And we often like to encourage people to start in basically a 10 meter by 10 meter kind of makeshift grid. And in that little area, take pictures of each and every species you encounter, every bug, every plant, every mushroom, every bird. And you'll be astonished at just how much biodiversity occurs in such a small spot. So it's a great opportunity to get people to kind of start seeing, basically start seeing the trees through the forest. You know, it's, we no longer need to quickly walk down a trail just to hit our one or two target species we're trying to photograph. If we go out with the intention of trying to just document everything and in hopes that a few of these images will be portfolio worthy, that's great. But you also have now amassed a huge amount of data that you can contribute to various projects. So what we did, um, Nature Photography Day, we decided to host a bio blitz, um, which was no set region. It just encouraged people to go out to a local er area near them. It could have been their own backyard. It could have been a local park didn't matter. And we allotted one week of shoot time. And so with this project, we wound up having just shy of 7,000 unique observations, just shy of 3,000 species observed, and 62 of, of from those, it was from 62 photographers. So once more and more people start becoming familiar with this project as a photographer, and they're willing to let their images go. Now that said, you can apply whatever type of copyright you want, all rights reserved through all creative commons to public domain. You set what you want these, um, the copyright credits to be. So you will certainly retain the rights to your images if you want to. 
So lastly, just a take home message as my time is wrapping up, participating in photography based citizen science projects is very valuable for conservation. I encourage you to find a project, whether it's local or national and get involved. Submit to iNaturalist and eBird because all records are important or another citizen science project. And most importantly, remember that anyone can be a conservation photographer. Thank you so much, Andrew, for that um, really, really extensive um, presentation and so much uh, exciting opportunities between these two presentations. I really appreciate it very much that you're here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and screen share. I will be presenting on endangered species, camera traps, and time-lapse photography. So, when I took a nature photography tour about Florida birds in March 2020, I was shocked to discover that 12 of the species I saw there were either endangered, threatened, or imperiled, which is near threatened. So this short video shows why rescuing, banding, and tracking wildlife is so important to help save wildlife. And we, Marshall will be talking about that next. In this video, I do want to mention when you see a couple pages with writing, don't try to read them. They're there for reference later on if you need them.
So Florida has 32 endangered or threatened birds and 28 mammals. Um, and roseate spoonbills have mostly moved out of Florida Bay at the southern tip of Florida because of sea level rise, <clears throat> excuse me, and because it has become salt water instead of fresh water <clears throat> due to the, so much Everglades fresh water being rerouted for agriculture. Spoonbills have been sighted as far north as Massachusetts. Also, the wildlife corridor for panthers and bears to travel up and down the state is too narrow and near highways in some places. Traveling to breed helps vary their DNA so they don't become extinct. So that's really important for them. So now let's take a minute and look at Georgia's. So here's the US Fish and Wildlife Service. We go to endangered species. And here we have plants, invertebrates, fish, reptiles, birds, and mammals. So let's look at birds. Um, the threatened birds are the eastern black rail, the piping plover, the red knot. Endangered species are Kirtland's warbler, wood stork, which is federally endangered, and the red cockaded woodpecker. Going back to here, let's look at mammals for a minute. Threatened species are the northern long-eared bat, the West Indi Indian manatee. Endangered species are the right whale, humpback whale, gray bat, and Indiana bat. So I think it's helpful for us to be aware of what's happening in our ecosystems as we photograph. But now we're going to switch and we're going to go to camera traps. So I learned about participatory research during my PhD work in education about um, a number of years ago, but I was reintroduced it to, as, to it as citizen science on a nature photography tour in 2018 to photograph jaguars in the Pantanal in Brazil. Ecotourism helps sustain local communities and it also saves the lives of jaguars who used to be hunted. Our local tour guide introduced us to the nonprofit Jaguar Identification Project, which identifies individual jaguars and their family trees using donated photographs. This jaguar is named Rayo, also affectionately called Mick Jaguar. And if you're the first person to, to photograph a jaguar, you get to name it. So that's pretty cool. Um, the Jaguar ID project uses crowdsourcing, camera traps, and direct education to study Jaguars and collaborate with local farmers and other nonprofits. I donated video to the Jaguar ID project to use and later made a movie. Hi, I'm Abby Martin, and I'm the creator of the Jaguar Identification Project. We use citizen science to study individual jaguar behavior in the northern Pantanal region of Porto Joffre, Mato Grosso, Brazil, home to the world's densest population of jaguars. By using citizen science, we are practicing a method of research that is completely uninvasive and sustainable. We provide jaguar field guides that you can use to identify the individual jaguar you're viewing in the river. The whole pattern of a jaguar is like a fingerprint. So you can use the forehead and the left and right side patterns to ID the individual you're watching. Camera Trap Research The Jaguar ID project also runs a camera trap project which is 100% funded by donations. So since 2013 we have 20 different camera traps set up between two different locations in the Pantanal. With the camera traps, we are monitoring jaguar density, but also looking at prey species availability. When a camera trap is donated, we share all the interesting photos to the donors. We also share that information with college students from Michigan University. So that was Abby's movie. I donated a camera trap to my elementary school where I work and Abby sent us some of the video from our camera trap. 
the date on the camera trap didn't get set correctly. However, there were 165 takes from just 19 days. I can't wait to see what she sends us next. We show these little videos on our school morning show. Are you supporting the Jaguar Identification Project? You've added value to the only place in the world where a wild jaguar is worth more than a dead one. So Panthera is a different nonprofit that protects big cats all over the world, like lions, tigers, and jaguar. I also donated video to Panthera. Panthera tracks the paths that jaguars travel using special cameras that take photos or video when animals walk by it. This has aided Panthera in discovering where to create preserved land. Teachers use photography, videos, and webcams in classrooms. So that just gives you an idea of some things you can create and ways you can contribute to education for kids. Um, this photographer is Mark Thomas. He's a professional photographer, nature photographer in Florida. And he has put camera traps in the Fakahatchee um, Preserve in Florida. If you look at the panther on the right, it appears to, to walk funny. It has appears to have leukomyelopathy, a neuromuscular condition that has been found in bobcats and panthers, and they don't know the cause. So Mark shares his trail cams with the park biologist and the Florida Wildlife Commission if an animal has this condition. And he uses a Browning Recon trail camera. Some of you all are familiar um, with uh, Carlton Ward. This is the F-Stop Foundation and it um, crowdsources photos and it uses volunteers to donate photos. And it also, it's a nonprofit and it also uses volunteers to put camera traps in different preserves in Florida to track panthers. It, this organization collaborates with the Florida Wildlife Corridor nonprofit, and which Carlton Ward is a big part of. And together, they just produced a film about the Florida Wildlife Corridor and ways to expand it. So we're going to switch one more time and talk about time lapse photography. So when I realized that an Easter Phoebe had built a nest in my porch, I put a video camera on a tripod and turned it on and went inside and stayed there. <laughs> and I did that for three days and I got six hours of video. And then I cut it down and edited it down to a minute. And um, 
you know, at first it was very dark. I had a light in it and I thought this looks like throwaway video. And it's very similar to what Andrew said. <clears throat> Even though it looks like throwaway video, it has scientific value. <clears throat> the University of Delaware had a size star project, What Do Birds Eat? So it has value um, for science. So in this time-lapse project, um, I set up a, a video camera on two different days a week apart. So on the first day, for four hours at a time each day, you can see that the little juvenile bald eagle is just kind of, he's just kind of sitting there. He's quiet. He's not moving around a lot. Um, but on the second day, the second day, which is a week later, you can see he's trying to fly and he's even jumping a little bit. And apparently the week after we left, which would have been the third time, he actually did fledge from the nest. So these are the kinds of things you can track with time lapse. You can also use it to track weather events as Caroline has mentioned. Um, the normal creek level here is a couple inches. The widest point is 30 feet over 14 years. There have been two major floods in this area, um, and they're both in the last six years. So if you look here at the height of this chair, this is what it normally looks like, even though it's after a flood. This is the 2015 flood, which lasted for four hours. This is the 2019 flood and you can see it's much higher. This kind of information is valuable not only for homeowners but it, but for city governments, roads and bridges, city planning, um, and weather, weather stations, weather um, organizations that are tracking changing weather patterns in particular areas. Um, this is another example, and, and this is a little bit similar to what Andrew was talking about. I am working actually on a uh, citizen science project to look at the ecosystem in a pond over two years. So I've taken video and photographs of this pond and to show all the creatures that live in it. You look at a pond and you think it's kind of quiet, nothing much happening, but I actually um, took video or photographs of over 21 different species in and around this pond. So there's a lot of magic that happens in a pond that you never realize actually is happening. So this concludes my presentation and um, it's been a delight to be able to share with you. 
And now I have the privilege of introducing Marsha Brand. And Marsha is the chair of our conservation committee. And she's going to be sharing a presentation about bird banding and tracking um, that was prepared by Tammy Cash, who is out of town. So take it away, Marsha. As Susan said, this is the work of Tammy Cash, who is one of the members of our conservation committee. And a lot of the photos are by her husband, Jimmy Cash. And she has done this for us on bird banding and its role in conservation and how you can help. These two little roseate spoonbill chicks were banded prior to fledging. You can see they have bands in the upper right and also bands on the lower left. Jimmy took this photograph. Most of us love birds. They're beautiful. They have beautiful music. And frankly, they're just plain interesting to watch. But they do so much more for us. They pollinate our plants. They spread seeds, seeds from our fruits and grains. They exterminate pests and rodents. They're very good indicators of our environmental health because their sensitivity to habit change can change bird populations. And they contribute to our economy. Think of all the money that's spent annually on bird watching and bird photographic activities, as well as hunting of game birds. This leads us to the purpose of this talk, how researchers conduct avian conservation science. The Bird Banding Laboratory, the BBL, was established in 1920, 101 years ago, as an integrated scientific program to study and protect North American birds. It's actually housed under the Department of Interior's US Geological Survey, the USGS. It approves and issues permits for banding in the US. It distributes annually over a million aluminum bands to scientists and banders in the US. And it's also the central depository for banding records for both the United States and Canada. It collects, it archives, it manages, and it disseminates information. Scientists gather information and data at the time of the initial banding. During encounters, such as we photographers might have, and during recaptures. Let's go over the vocabulary. Banded is when a bird receives its unique federal band. An encounter is simply any observation of a previously banded bird. And a recapture is a special case when a bird is captured by a permitted bander, either the person who originally banded it or someone else who is also a permitted bander. Data is collected and added to each bird's file. This is where we come in. We as photographers can help further the studies by reporting each banded bird that we encounter. These are the ways that information from banded birds and reported encounters are used. They're used to monitor the status and trends of both resident and migratory bird populations. They're used to identify and understand many ecological issues. They develop effective science management and, and conservation practices, study the behavior and the social structure, the lifespan, the survival rate. And there's a hundred and plus year history between the BBL, the Banding Service and the US Fish and Wildlife Services that analyzes the data and it's all used by the US Fish and Wildlife Services for avian conservation and management. This really helped enact the Endangered Species Act of 1973 because they had the data to support the observation that birds were diminishing in number. It's also used for hunting regulation development for detecting changes in waterfowl populations and for measuring the vulnerability of age and sex classes. 
the United States BBL collaborates with the Bird Banding Office of the Canadian Wildlife Services and administers the American, North American Bird Banding Program. This manages more than 75 million archived records and over 5 million records of encounters. Additionally, every year, approximately 1 million bands are shipped out to banders. Close to 100,000 band encounter reports are submitted to the BBL data that is beneficial to ongoing research and studies. There are actually 7,500 permitted banders in the United States. Some of them are master banders and some of them are sub permittees who work under the master banders. So how can we as photographers help? First, by looking for bands when we photograph birds. And I must confess this, I never looked for bands. In fact, sometimes I tried to make sure that I was photographing birds that didn't have bands because I wanted this pristine bird. Sometimes the bands can be difficult to spot, especially if they're small birds or they're at great distances. But if you do observe a band while you are photographing, try to take a photo where you can focus in on the bands. That way, the information can be read on the band. When you're viewing your downloaded images or even going through your past images, if you take time to zoom in and look for the bands, you may just find some surprises. Tammy and Jimmy said they have several times. In this photo, they were photographing oyster catchers on Jekyll Island and they didn't see the three bands until they downloaded the photo. And lastly, report, report, report your encounters. Even if you can't read the band, it's still a good idea to report your encounters. When you're looking for the bands, they come in all sorts of different colors and shapes and sizes. Here's an overview of some of the things that you might be wanting to look for. These federal bands are typically made of aluminum. They come in different sizes and they are butt end for most birds, but they are lock-on bands for hawks and owls or rivet bands for eagles. I guess the eagles are pretty rough on those bands. There are 25 standard sizes and five specialty sized bands. And they're made to accommodate the smallest little hummingbird to the large trumpeter swan. There are also some auxiliary markers. There are neck bands or collars that can help Researchers identify an individual bird. They are used by the researchers and certified banders to not only have federal banding permits, but also they have to have additional marking authorizations in order to put any of these on the birds. So this can't be done by just anybody. They could also be colored lake flags. I wondered if these bothered the birds. And I was told that no, they don't. And I guess they figured that out because the birds don't go picking at them trying to get them off, they just ignore them. The colored leg bands can be made from plastic or metal. They can come in a variety of colors. They can have more than one band on the legs. They have bands that are above the knee and bands below the knee. On the left is a Florida scrub jay with a colored band on each leg below the knee and a federal band on the left leg. And on the right is an oyster catcher with three bands. These were taken by Jimmy Cash. They even have transmitters on some of the birds and have other electronic devices too. Here's an example of a net collar with a radio transmitter attached for a Canada goose. Whooping cranes with transmitter on a leg harness are on the bottom, Jimmy Cash photo, that one. And also on the right leg above, as you can see. And there are panageal or wing markers. These 
are shapes of vinyl, often circles or like cattle ear tags, attached to the leading edge of the wing. They're very visible in flight and often on perched birds as well. This is a photo of a California condor that won an Audubon Photography Award. And I know myself, I have seen the condors in the Grand Canyon with these markers on them. There are some special markers called nasal markers for ducks. There are saddles that are put over the bill. These are used to study local movements and behaviors of ducks, and they're only allowed for use within a specific area. They're not widely used. There are even some bands that can get you money, can get you a reward. Photographing or harvesting a banded waterfowl, fowl is a banded waterfowl, right? A banded waterfowl is a rare and special event as a small number of waterfowl are banded. Waterfowl band recoveries help biologists to know how the waterfowl harvest is distributed throughout states and flyways, because we know that these are migratory birds. This data can be used to estimate the age, the sex, the species specific survival, harvest rates, crippling losses, recovery rates, and banned reporting rates. To facilitate higher reporting rates, some banded waterfowl have an additional federal reward band. Report it and send it in to receive a check for the amount engraved on the band. I'm gonna be looking for some of those. Now, important, how do you report the band? First of all, it's important to report not only live encounters, but also deceased and harvested, meaning hunted, banded birds. The information needed is the date, the time, and the location with GPS if possible, the species if you know it, which legs or leg have bands, as well as the color and location of the bands, and if the black band has a flag or an alphanumeric code on it, if you can read it. The example shown here has a band on the upper left, the lower left, the upper right, and possibly the lower right too, it's kind of hard to tell. You report the band to www.reportband.gov. Can't get any easier than that. Reportband.gov. Photos can be uploaded during the reporting process. If you see a banded bird while you're photographing it, again, try to zoom in to see if you can see the writing on the band. Sometimes it's pretty hard to do. I looked at my hummingbirds this year and I couldn't see any at all. If a bird is deceased or harvested, after noting and reporting the location of the band, you can remove and keep it. This photo looks like it's a trophy of someone's bands that they have found. Reporting is really easy. Here is a page from the reporting site and you just fill it in and then you get a certificate of appreciation from the USGS. If you have sufficient information for the bird banding lab to locate the information on the banded bird, Help protect our birds. Report your encounters. If you're a member, spread the word. If you're not a member of GNPA and you're watching this, by all means, take a look at the benefits you get from membership. You can see presentations and speakers, nearly 100 a year. You can participate in our photography competitions, workshops, field trips, or classes. You can attend our annual GNPA Expo. We have a newsletter. We get discounts from our partners. And we all love to share our photographs and share our photograph expeditions with you. So here are the websites to write down and remember, although this will also be 
on our website, www.reportband.gov and www.gnpa.org. And now I would like to introduce to you another member of our conservation committee. Chris Dahl is going to give you some photographs that show you exactly what happens when hummingbirds are banded. Take it away, Chris. Thank you, Marcia. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, let me take you back. First, let me just tell you that, like most of you, my interest uh, is photography, and I like uh, nature photography, landscapes, and wildlife photography. And in 2019, I was very interested in finding uh, subjects to photograph. And my wife uh, noted that there was a uh, garden near us over in Kennesaw called Smith Gilbert Gardens. So I went over to Smith Gilbert Gardens to take photos in the butterfly house, but uh, the young lady at the desk upsold me for an annual membership and uh, told me about the, the hummingbird banding event. So I went over to the hummingbird banding event the day that it was held. And this uh, young lady here, Julia from Birdwatcher Supply, ran the event and she's the certified bander. And uh, I just took photos. I wasn't there. Uh, I had no inkling of citizen science. Uh, I was just there to take photographs and to uh, see the event. Uh, I love hummingbirds. And I can't tell you how educational this event was. Uh, Julia did a wonderful job of telling you about the birds and how they migrate and what they go through and explaining the banding process for the birds. And to me, one of the more entertaining things was she would take the birds when they were ready to release them, put them in the kid's hands. And then when she would let go, that bird would just sit there kind of in a, uh, an unknowing state for a minute until they would kind of puff on it. And that little puff of air, the bird would take off and fly away. And uh, you'll see a couple of photos uh, scroll through here where the birds are taking off out of the kids' hands and the kids just absolutely loved it and were so entertained by it. Um, but the event happens every year. Unfortunately, I didn't go this year, uh, but it's truly a, uh, a unique experience. It's a very educational experience um, and it's well worth the, uh, the price of admission. Uh, so if you're near a botanical gardens that hosts something like this, I would encourage you to join that botanical garden. And uh, now that I'm aware of citizen science, I'm certainly going to take a good close look at all of my photographs as I'm going out and capturing them for myself. And the ones that uh, warrant uh, being donated to some institution are gonna be given to that institution so that they can use them. So I hope you've enjoyed this and gosh, I don't see uh, Tom, so. You don't see me, I'm right, I'm oh, here. there you are, Tom. Yep. So let me introduce Tom and let me stop sharing my screen. And then Tom's gonna take on the, uh, the role of presenter here. Hi, y'all. Well, thanks, Chris. And, and I'm delighted to be here and I'm gonna share with you something that is not your standard kind of photography. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, quite different, uh, uses a sort of a different kind of, uh, of equipment. Uh, very, very uh, different from what most of us think about with, with photography. But it, it's a good example of citizen science and the impact that you can make as an individual with citizen science. So I'm going to tell you how I sort of 10 years ago went from being a, an amateur astronomer hobbyist to a scientist. Well, no, wait a minute. That's an overclaim. I went to being a research assistant um, because there are amateur astronomers all over the world with telescopes um, that can do what professionals cannot, which is to point their telescopes all over the place. Whereas big telescopes on the planet 
um, require a lot of, you know, advanced planning. There's only a limited amount of time. There's that time is very precious. But amateur astronomers um, can really almost always, you know, at least there's one amateur astronomer um, on, on almost any clear night that has a clear window to the sky. And one of the places that um, we are really, really used is with planetary astronomy and our data can be used. But I'm going to talk first about just the ways that amateur astronomers uh, help to make discoveries. And here's an example of an article about an amateur astronomer who working independently helped uncover some information about the planet Neptune. And that was kind of self-guided research. Most of the amateur astronomers that are working to support uh, professional scientists are working in collaboration with those professional scientists. So, uh, for an example, the Association of Variable Star, American Association of Variable Star Observers, is an organization that really goes back to the first part of the 20th century. And those are people who have used their telescopes to make light curves of variable stars. And by doing those observations diligently and every clear night and making recordings, they're able to um, make light curves of variable stars. Well, what can you do with that? Well, professionals can do all sorts of stuff with that. Uh, first of all, amateurs right now working with uh, professional astronomers have actually discovered exoplanets. Um, the amateurs are given candidate stars to monitor with their telescopes. Um, they, they follow it, make a light curve, and um, sure enough, several of them have discovered exoplanets and then have gone on to follow up that, um, that discovery. Barbara Harris, uh, on the right in this um, uh, slide, uh, is an amateur in Florida. She's actually a retired OBGYN. And she um, had is very active with the Association of Variable Star Observers and actually made a critical discovery of a nova outburst. Um, and this was actually printed from Astronomy Magazine. So um, significant discoveries can be made. Well, planetary imaging is one of those cases where amateurs can, you know, professionals cannot afford the telescope time to be constantly monitoring planets. Uh, but amateurs with new techniques and with new digital uh, capabilities can actually take um, incredibly detailed photographs of planets. Now, uh, you can probably see Jupiter there. That's an image that I made with my telescope. There's actually two images of Jupiter right above each other that were made at different times. You can see an image of Saturn. You can see Mars on there. What's really important about those two planets, Jupiter and Saturn, is that they're gas planets. And so the atmospheres of those planets are constantly changing. And professional astronomers actually use data collected by amateurs in order to then make measurements of how quickly, how rapidly those, um, those um, surface features are changing. So the way that they do that, uh, oh, by the way, my inspiration to get started on this was a fellow by the name of Anthony Wesley, who is an amateur astronomer in Australia and made a discovery in 2009 um, of a uh, strike uh, on the planet Jupiter. So he actually found an impact um, that was, that was uh, newly discovered on Jupiter. So I decided to take my own telescope, this small little, tele compared to Anthony's anyway, that mine, mine's just a little 10 inch telescope, but it's enough uh, to get good detailed information that can be helpful to professional astronomers. And so using that telescope, and a very different imaging uh, train than you might have imagined. That little blue box is the camera. And that little blue box uh, is essentially a video camera, 640 by 480 pixels. Um, and it makes uh, 30 and sometimes 60 images frames per second. And you can run about two minutes of, of, um, of video 
on uh, Jupiter or on Saturn, but those planets are moving so fast, they rotate so quickly that you can't go for more than about two minutes without blurring the image. And then you use image stacking software that's available on the web that allows you to stack those frames and then create an image that's highly detailed. If you notice the image to the left, these are actually the same image in different uh, stages of the processing. So the image to the left is the first stage of this, the image stacking stage. And then the image to the right is the final stage of the final image of Jupiter. And you can see the incredible detail um, that is available uh, to that. So then, then what the amateur does is they upload this information to various sites where they are available to professional astronomers. So for example, the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers is a place where professionals can go for uh, amateur images. There's Alpo Japan that is also another location for that. Um, there are uh, sites on uh, Facebook uh, where uh, professionals go to get, uh, get amateur images. Here's an example of my images being used by uh, Dr. Glenn Orton of the uh, Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena uh, to use, if you notice, those are my images there that are used in this uh, presentation that he did comparing white light images that I took with infrared images that were taken at Mauna Kea, the observatory at Mauna Kea, Hawaii. So it helps them to have that comparison image uh, so that they can compare that to the, uh, to the infrared uh, the infrared image. Also, Juno mission planning, as you all may know, there's actually a spacecraft in orbit around Jupiter right now. And that spacecraft uses, in their planning of what they're going to do, they use uploaded images in white light by amateur astronomers, amateur imagers, uh, to plan their, uh, their imaging runs themselves. So, uh, to the left, that's an image that I uploaded to the site in 2015, and to the right is one I uploaded just the other day. So that's very useful to them in their mission planning. Um, PVOL is the um, Planetary Virtual Observatory and Laboratory where images can be uploaded. And I, as you can see, I uploaded about 164 images. I haven't been as active lately, but we'll get active again. Well, here's a, a great example. Um, in 2011, some my um, Saturn image of the, the uh, storm on Jupiter was used with other uh, amateur astronomers. And I was actually uh, received credit um, in an article on that storm by Dr. Augustin Sanchez La Vega uh, that went into the uh, professionally, uh, the peer reviewed journal uh, Nature. Uh, and so you'll notice that my, my name is among many other amateurs around the world who help, you know, gather data. Now, all I did was provide a data point, but it was a needed data point and it helped them do their research. So not really the kind of photography that most of us do, uh, but at the same time, it just shows the power of, of citizen science and what, um, and, and the real power here is just the combined effort of all these amateurs across the world who are willing to donate their time and, and the use of their instruments uh, to kind of keep a constant view on these planets and then provide that information to professionals who are doing research. Uh, and it's very helpful. In fact, I would say that a lot of them couldn't do their research at all without uh, submissions from amateur astronomers. So. Um, Thanks for the opportunity to tell you about that. And I think I turn it over at this point to Susan. So I just really, again, want to thank Andrew and Caroline for some really stellar presentations and introducing us to these really important concepts about citizen science and encouraging us to, you know, recognize that um, this photographs and video that we take does not have to be um, anything fancy, that it's meaningful um, data. We're going to open it up to questions in just a second. And I want to thank also Tom, Marcia, and Chris 
um, for their presentations too, which were just, all of them were just fabulous. And I'm really excited to be here. This webinar will be on the GNP PA website. I just wanna remind you along with the article I wrote about citizen science, and there will be a list of links so that you can look back on this if you would like to. So if you have questions now, please put them in the Q&A section. <laughs> Someone in uh, chat asked me where the Hummingbird Banding event was. It was Smith Gilbert Gardens in Kennesaw, Georgia. Thank you. I just thought it... I just thought it was interesting that Susan said that the first two presentations were, were stellar. And I want you to notice that mine was only <laughs> planetary. So <laughs> they were all stellar. <laughs> That's a little fun. That's all. I know. It's great. <laughs> Actually, I have, Tom, I have a question for you. And <laughs> the question has to do with astrophotography or planetary photography. How do you get started? I, I mean, you know, you gotta, it, it's a bit of an, like nature photography, it is a, a financial investment. And it's not yeah. like I can go to my neighborhood telescope store. That's right. Well, it, you know, and, and anyone, I'm, uh, anyone is welcome to email me and I'm vice president. So you, all you have to do is go vice president at GMPA and, and you'll get through to me. Um, but it's actually one of the most accessible types of astrophotography. And the reason that it is, is that the guiding of the, of the image is not as critical. Since it's video, it doesn't have to stay in exactly the same place like a long exposure does. And so the right. mount is like two orders of magnitude less important and therefore less expensive than uh, what you would use for um, you know, for um, deep sky imaging. And so in a lot of ways, it's a very accessible way to do it. And believe it or not, it's not that difficult to learn. A lot of the software is pretty easy, uh, is, is free on the internet. Uh, and it's actually a learning curve that I would say is probably much less steep than, you know, traditional deep sky astrophotography. I have a question for Andrew. Um, <clears throat> could, I would, I know you mentioned briefly that you do a lot of work in Guyana. Could you tell us just a little bit about your work there and what you do? Sure. Um, so I got started in Guyana back in 2011 at the start of my PhD research. Um, so I was working at the time with an organization called Operation Wallacea, which is a conservation slash um, early career uh, starter organization, basically, where they bring in um, college students, uh, high school students internationally to basically come and work with researchers um, and get the full field experience. Um, so I started with them years back before that, um, doing work in Honduras as a volunteer, then got carried on as an actual staff scientist. Um, so spent a few summers doing work there, training you know the next generation of young biologists, um, and then moved on to a few separate areas where I was conducting my own personal research. Um, this basically involved myself, a few guides, loading up boats with rations and our camping equipment to go live in our hammocks in the middle of the jungle for a month or two and just set up new camps and try to discover everything about the local uh, amphibians and reptiles in areas that hadn't been surveyed before. Um, and then kind of after that, I was able to join on some expeditions with um, World Wildlife Fund and Global Wildlife Conservation, which is now rewild. Um, and they basically helicoptered us into areas that um, had never been scientifically explored before, um, but were also facing kind of imminent conservation threats. So, you know, it kind of took the on the ground survey work to provide the key information to the government to make decisions as to what they should do. Um, and so kind of been continuing with that work. I have an expedition ideally taking place next year in an area that a whole lot of mining companies have tried to claim 
concessions on um, in an area that is guaranteed to have undescribed species. So we kind of just bring in the team of international and local biologists and try to provide all of the the key data to the decision makers um, to help influence their decisions to ideally making the right decision. Could you talk a little bit, I mean, that sounds really important. Could you talk a little bit about how you use photography in your work? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's sometimes it's hard to communicate, um, you know, science, for lack of better words, to decision makers as well as to the general public. You know, people have fanciful ideas of what it's like when you go to these locations. Um, so by being able to provide, you know, fantastic imagery, ideally, of the expedition of the species you're encountering, of just basically day-to-day -day life of living in the field. It helps people relate more. And as with anything in photography, the key thing is causing a connection with the image. You know, if I sit there and describe that I found this new species of frog that happens to not be particularly colorful or attractive, but by being able to provide the image um, you know, in a high resolution way, um, so they can see it up close, all the fine details, they understand it a bit better. And then by default, they care a little bit more. So photography is just such a, a incredible way to, you know, make someone on the complete opposite side of the world realize that an area that's important to you should be important to them too. Have you had much success in saving some of these areas through your work? Um, yeah, so one area, it was back in 2014, there was a logging company um, that, you know, they were supposed to do things a certain way, only extract certain types of trees. But when we got in there, it was clear that they were just literally clear cutting everything to the ground. And the abundance levels of jaguar, of puma, of basically all the cats known from Guyana, all, and from my research side of things, all the amphibians and reptiles were hyper abundant. It was just an incredibly pristine area and being able to bring this back to the government, they actually revoked the logging company's license and kicked them out of the country. Wow. We have a question from the audience um, this is directed to Andrew. Love the presentation. I'm not sure how, where to contribute my photos when I look at a 10 by 10 area. Uh, I suspect the Napa website will tell me, but can you be a little more precise? How do I do this? Sure. So this is more, um, it's not an actual project, but basically a, a recommendation. Um, kind of training people to focus on just a smaller area. So if you're really keen on actually measuring the area, I'd, I'd recommend just taking, um, uh, just measuring an area that's 10 meters by 10 meters and just making a square grid and then documenting everything you find in there. But the idea is not so much sticking solely to the 10 by 10 grid, but to encourage you to just look at the things that you might otherwise not have paid attention to, especially if you're a photographer that prioritizes things like birds. Mm -hmm. Good night, all. I have to rejoin my other meeting. Thanks for being here, Tom. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, y'all. Lee, are there any more questions for the audience, from the audience? I can't see them. Uh, let's see. Uh, dee, 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 dee. I just sent Lee a chat about something someone asked about earlier. Yeah, unfortunately, they didn't put it in the Q&A, so I don't know where to even look. Um, geez. Somebody How wanted to know about the Oki Twitter Finocchi. handle. I've got one. How about our own Oki Finoki? and the threat of that mining south of it, can anything be done about that? I'll chime in on that real quick. I mean, that is basically what the, the whole point of what I was trying to relate with my, my presentations that, yeah, 
everybody can make a difference by going in there, taking pictures, documenting what's there, what stands to be lost if mining you know, goes on, and sharing it, sharing it to important citizen science databases, publishing, you know, if you publish about it in your own blog or, um, you know, just raising attention through social media. Um, the more you can do to get in there, share images and talk about it and put it in front of people's faces, it all makes a difference. What about sending it to decision makers? Is that, a, is that an option? Yeah, too? absolutely. Send it to the, the key politicians and the decision makers for, for what's going to go on. Um, the more that they realize the public cares about it, and it stands to potentially impact their reelection. Um, it's it's definitely a good way to go. Have you found that? I don't know if you do any work in the United States, but have you found that to be effective here in the states? Yeah, I mean, it's it's it can be hit or miss. Um, I have some colleagues through Nampa that have really campaigned a lot of politicians for the work that they've done. Um, one in particular, Krista Schleyer, with her. Um, border wall project. Um, obviously, in recent administrations, things have changed since her project had started. But at the time, a lot of the work that she did was really instrumental for decision making for politicians as to whether they would support something like that. Good. Any, Marcia, did you have a question that someone wrote? Someone wanted to know about the, t the Twitter handle for a bird site or a birder that Caroline mentioned. In the oh, beginning. yes. I put that in the chat. Um, Deja Perkins, uh, at naturally wild underscore on Twitter. She's amazing. She and I actually did a live stream series for a really long time called Make It Count Monday, um, where we did a different project each week. Um, and if you ever want to watch any of those, they're all on YouTube. We covered everything from the science of microbes and sourdough to, of course, birding. Do we have any other questions, Lee? Uh, Mickey asks, how do we know who to campaign about the Okie Finoki? It's good. You'd have to look up um, basically whose district those are, um, the area falls in, um, and that would be a good first place to start. Um, but simultaneously to that would be, you know, working on any type of social media campaigns to get more people to care about it than just taking it directly. You know, it's important to, to go to the people who are responsible, but if you can go in mass in numbers that you get with social media attention, that's always really helpful. Also the Georgia Environmental Protect Protection Department, those are decision makers too, besides, I'm, I guess your local um, con Congress, your state congressman, representative and senator, right? But yeah, social media campaigns are powerful. Okay. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up. I want to thank everybody for joining our panelists, Susan, for putting this together, Marcia, mm -hmm. Chris, Carolyn, Andrew, Tom, Tom. <laughs> I'll get Tom later. And I uh, hope everybody has a good evening. Thank you, Lee.